Esta conferencia comenzará a grabarse. So, the session is um, uh, Pierre Kerner uh, kindly accepted to record the session because we had requests for some people that cannot attend the session but still find the topic very interested in. It is so. I will start this session by presenting uh, Pierre Kerner to you, and then I will uh, give him uh, the talk. So. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Cool. So thank you all uh, for being here this morning. Um, so it's our great pleasure to welcome Dr. Pierre Kerner, uh, a researcher from uh, the Institut Jacques Monod at the formerly known uh, Université Paris Diderot, which is known today as Université de Paris where he holds a position of <clears throat> associate professor in the team of uh, the professor Michel Verport and on stem cells development and evolution. And Pierre Kerner is actually very dedicated to teaching how to communicate science uh, with his students at the university because he created um, recently um, a new teaching unit um, called Bionumeric, where students are encouraged to create um, like posts on a online blog to uh, communicate around a, a scientific concept. Um, and it's actually also interesting that Pierre Kerner is using uh, uh, polling tools uh, on some of his classes where he challenges students to answer a question, uh, a poll on Twitter, and then compare the results of his students with the Twitter sphere. So really using tools in, uh, in, as pedagog pedagogical tools. But also Pierre is very broadly known for his strong presence on uh, social media, especially with his blog, uh, Strange Stuff and Funky Things, that I'm pretty sure he will um, present to you in much greater details. And through his blog and Twitter and Facebook, he shares with us fun facts about science and nature. But he's also very present on uh, Postcast Science, which is a French uh, postcast radio channel talking about also science. And he's also collaborating a lot with YouTubers, uh, French science communicators, uh, YouTubers, where he uh, started writing his last book, Nature Secret, with uh, Patrick Beau, um, so he's also a writer on top of all these other things. And he's also collaborated with another YouTuber very recently and started a series of video for Science and V TV to continue his work on science communications. But I don't want to spoil you with everything and I'm very happy to give uh, Pierre Kerner uh, now it's time to present us uh, his, uh, his work. Great. Um, Mathieu, could you allow me to share my... Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Here you go. And are everyone uh, capable of looking my uh, my screen now? Yes, for me it's working. Great. So thank you, uh, Mathieu, for the very kind and uh, uh, and short uh, presentation of uh, my work, which I will present because what I wanted to 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 tell you today is uh, how I use a scientific outreach toolbox to become a scientific communicator around my uh, career as a normal uh, in quotes. Um, <clears throat> In quote marks, sorry, uh, a normal uh, researcher and assistant professor. So uh, the idea is to tell you how to become a science communicator if you choose to 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 communicate science, and uh, the idea would be actually to 
to tell you what are the diverse way to communicate your own research or research in general or scientific enthusiasm in general because i tried all, all these things so what will look like a very long resume is actually a way for me to show you how i actually dwell in scientific communication because it's one of my passion and the idea behind that is for you to take whatever tools you seem necessary or useful for your own uh, science communication quests and it all started as i wanted to become a blogger in 2009 so uh, as a genesis of this project let me tell you how i became a blogger and it all started at the last uh, sorry um just before that, I wanted to to, uh, to to give a presentation of all my scientific outreach project, but I, I feel that Mathieu has done a, a good job of doing that. So I have a blog, uh, which is called Strange Stuff and Funky Things. I indeed participate on a podcast called Podcast Science, and I participate also in radio shows at Radio France on France Inter and, uh, and um, France Culture. I, my blog belonged to a scientific communication community called the Café des Sciences. I founded uh, a community myself inside the Café des Sciences dedicated to uh, video science uh, communication. And I also wrote three books, all of which I'm going to actually uh, talk about because it's all different aspects of scientific communication. So. As I told you, uh, the way I started uh, my blog is actually on the last year of my uh, thesis preparation. My thesis was called uh, Study of the uh, Nervous System Evolution in Animals, Comparative Neurogenesis and Phylogenomics. And the last year, I, uh, as I was writing my manuscript, and maybe some of you are going to share that feeling, I had some ideas on ways to actually blow steam uh, and do something else that just focusing on my uh, science project, on my thesis uh, theme. So that's why I created a blog uh, called Strange Stuff and Funky Things. So that was the beginning. And as you can see, uh, it had a quite different banner that I uh, pulled up together. And the idea was just to talk about very, very different topics. As you can see, uh, if you if you go on the first posts in, in this blog, you will see that the first topic that I found uh, fascinating was how uh, people were actually um, using uh, colors and and uh, and sorry uh, uh, toileting uh, skills in order to disguise dogs as uh, for, for here a uh, teenage uh, mutant, uh, mutant turtle. I was also fascinated by uh, parasitism and very strange organisms such as the blobfish that is depicted on the right side. So very different from actual my actual research. But as I told you, it was an idea to actually blow steam and uh, it got very interesting, it got very fun, and I wanted to continue to do that while I was working on my manuscript. So, um, uh, spoiler alert, it's not very good to actually do uh, start a blog and uh, create uh, and uh, work on your uh, manuscript. I had a long, very long nights in order to manage the two, and I would not recommend uh, doing the, this sort of thing. Anywho, I did present my thesis, I became a doctor, and I was stuck with my blog that I found very interesting and, and wanted to continue. And uh, actually, the thing is, when you start a blog, you, you want to promote your content at some point because you, you, you feel that it's important to share uh, how you can actually uh, have very uh, strange dogs uh, cut or if, if you want to, to show parasitums to, to other organisms. So that's um, the the idea was that if every time you had a, a, a content on your blog, you needed to actually promote it somewhere. And at that time, in 2009, it was the beginning of social media. You didn't have pages on Facebook. You didn't have all sort of things. So you have actually all sort of platforms in order to show your blog posts on dedicated platforms. Here you can see actually there's Reddit, but uh, the early version, but uh, also a lot of platforms that have completely disappeared since then. And um, my, to my dismay, I did not find 
any uh, dedicated platform in science. But that was because I was looking basically in English. And when I tried to find a dedicated blog platform for science in French, I found what it was called at the time, le Café des Sciences, with uh, at sign um, at the, in the middle of Café, and which was not exactly a platform, but a community of science communicators, uh, science bloggers at the time. And in order to have your content shared on their platform, you had actually to be part of the association, the Café des Sciences. And so I actually applied with my strange blog. Uh, and the idea was for them to see if my scientific content was somewhat uh, in line with the ideas of science communication in, the, in, their, in their platform. So I applied in March 2009, it was one, one month after my thesis, uh, defense, and I became a member, <clears throat> which was very strange because at, at the time my, my content was not very scientific and very diverse. I have been a member of the Café des Sciences since then, and the Café des Sciences has changed drastically over the years. Now it looks more like that, and I'm happy to have on my blog this uh, little um, uh, thumbnail that says that I am a member of uh, now a, a community that is 200 and more uh, members strong. So at that time, uh, because I joined the Café des Sciences, it, it had uh, an effect on my editorial style and I tried more and more to add normal or uh, more rigorous, more accurate scientific content. That's why at the beginning, I tried to actually talk about dinosaurs and dinosaur feathers. I tried to talk about uh, Toxoplasma gondii, uh, a parasite that uh, showed uh, several signs of altering the behavior of mice. I talked about, um, and actually I um, asked some of my colleagues in my lab to work on my uh, blog to, to add blog posts and to talk about, for instance, um, um, here uh, a particular fossil that was important uh, in highlighting the, our own uh, lineage, the human lineage evolution. But I also tried to do science communication my own way. And that is why when you look at the time uh, where this kind of blog post uh, appeared, there were other blog posts such as um, uh, a, sn uh, a snake with tentacles, someone who drank uh, silver collegium and became uh, to, ha had his skin become blue, and a parasite of our uh, navel uh, with a little flush that you can find in your navel. And all of that with scientific uh, communication in mind. So I wanted to not only talk about everything, but I wanted to add a scientific accuracy when I talked about everything. So whenever you see one of these blog posts, those are some substituted with uh, references and sources and everything. Uh, as you can see, the um, banner has also changed. And this is because I asked uh, several animators and illustrators to work on a particular new banner, an animated banner. So I'm, I'm actually going to show you how this banner works. Unfortunately, it works on Adobe Flash, and meaning that uh, soon it's going to completely be unable to show on, on uh, phones and, and, and everything. So here is my blog. And as you can see, if you click here, it says that you need to install the plugin, Flash plugin. So I'm going to allow that. And here is, you see that it's uh, actually animated. You won't be able to hear it, but you, there is a lot of animation. You can click on everything. There you go. You can click on the floss. You can see here is a little plant and everything. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll let you go to, to, to this uh, banner if you want to see it uh, animated. It's very fun and uh, everything is almost uh, clickable. You can click on, the, on this and then go to the particular topic. Here is ferrofluids. All right, so let's go back to presentation.
do you see the entire screen now? Uh, everything is fine? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Perfect. So as you can probably guess, this animated banner was not free to acquire. I actually asked uh, uh, a lot of people to join in uh, with a, um, a, funding, a fund uh, raising uh, campaign on Kiss Kiss Bank Banks, where I asked for this amount of money in order to have uh, the ability to pay the illustrators and animators in order to animate it. It's meaning that I had to have uh, um, as many backers as possible and this also shaped my way of uh, communicating science because as I had personal projects I had to gather a community on social media and I'm going to tell you at the end of the presentation how actually to manage uh, different uh, science media accounts especially Twitter because it was the uh, most uh, uh, efficient in order to, to back up uh, different projects. All right, recently I also created a newsletter and that is actually a very interesting way to communicate science. So every time there is a new blog post on my blog or every time I have a new project, uh, I actually uh, post it uh, every month on a newsletter using MailChimp. So by the end of the presentation, if you have uh, any questions on blogging, MailChimp, and every tool that I'm going to, to actually mention, be free to, to, to ask questions specifically on these uh, particular topics. So uh, one thing that I wanted to tell you about is how the Café des Sciences is now working. So as I told you, it's a platform, a community with 200 members. And the idea is to have a platform where every member can freely share automatically their content on the same platform. Meaning that, uh, for instance, every blog post that are posted on my blog that are relevant to science, for sure, are uh, g um, acquired and automatically um, uh, posted on the platform. But it's also, as I told you, an association. So that's why <clears throat> there was a, um, uh, a process for which you had to apply for to enter the association. And this means that your content is at that time reviewed for, uh, by uh, fellow members. And uh, sometimes you can be accepted in the community or rejected. And it's uh, usually a very long process. And you have to, to have at least six months of existence and as a science uh, communicator in order to um, enter the Café des Sciences. And it's also a mailing list. Uh, and uh, more recently, a uh, Discord platform where you can actually interact with all the other members of the community. But the Café des Sciences is also organizing other ways to, to communicate science, such as festivals. We have also the opportunity to have our own content peer-reviewed between each other because it's all um, uh, benevolent work. Uh, it means um, that uh, the peer review process is not mandatory, but voluntary, and means that you have to uh, create a network of peer reviewers around your work. Uh, and it's a kind of a tit for tat uh, process where if you peer review someone's content, maybe at, a, at a, some other point in the, in the future, you will, uh, you will actually return the favor. And more recently, during the uh, coronavirus uh, outbreak, there has been a push in order to communicate science using uh, live platforms such as Twitch. So now there is also a strong push of the uh, Café des Sciences community to appear uh, and uh, create live content. Um, so if you have questions on that, uh, I, can, uh, I can actually uh, dwell more on, on that uh, later. We also have content uh, that has been created uh, inside the Café des Sciences that is dedicated to children, if that's something that interests you. And the project is a, a community project. It's a, it's a, a project uh, from many different bloggers or uh, YouTubers that uh, collect contents and put it on a platform that is called Kiddy Science. Finally, just a... Uh, as a general uh, information, uh, the Café des Sciences is not the only French-speaking um, 
platforms that exist. As you can see, there is a platform on the Le Monde uh, uh, Journal, uh, Silogs is another one, L'Esprit Sorcier, Collective Conscience, uh, My Silence Work, and, and everything. Uh, but the Café des Sciences is the one that I know best because actually I belong to this community. In uh, 2012 and 2013, I did a, a lot of, so it's been uh, several years that I've been uh, blogging and I became the vice president of the Café des Sciences because as I told you, it's an association. And one of the idea I had is actually to promote the content of the Café des Sciences using different media. And one of them was to actually uh, have one minute editorials on the uh, and a show, a radio show that exists on the France Inter that's called La Tête au Carré. So in one minute, I presented a blog post or YouTube content uh, during this, uh, the, uh, an entire year. So it was basically the uh, actuality de la blogosphere, the, the blogosphere uh, news that I presented for an entire year and that enabled the uh, Café des Sciences to have more uh, a, a, a larger audience. And uh, in parallel to that, the, the idea did not come from uh, nowhere. I actually love the radio. I love the, um, the, the audio media, as you can tell by my, uh, my mic that I use for, for, for this presentation. Um, and that's because I belong to another uh, project that's called Podcast Science. And uh, now, nowadays, podcasting is trending and it's becoming more and more popular, but I, I belong to this podcast. So it's very uh, root-based, a uh, very dynamic uh, community that exists since 2010. And um, I'm very proud to, to actually belong to this community. And the idea is that we have a live show every Wednesday at uh, 8.30, where we actually talk about science. And Podcast Science has been founded by uh, Alan and Mathieu, uh, who are two actually um, uh, computer engineers and do not come from an academic scientific uh, background and wanted to present science topic uh, to a general community, a general general audience that is not that we consider is not stupid, but uh, not um, uh, scientific literate, meaning that you have to explain every word. And it's a very, uh, I'm very enthusiastic about this kind of uh, scientific uh, approach, a scientific communication approach. Okay, and uh, actually inside Podcast Science, we have a particular format that I found uh, rather fascinating and very, uh, uh, I'm very enthusiastic about the, this project. It's called Radio Live Sketch Show. And that is actually an, in the nexus of uh, several of my passions. Science communication, of course, radio show, and uh, sketching, uh, illustration. I'm, uh, as you can tell from um, the animated banner that I have uh, on my blog, I'm, I'm re really into web comics and uh, illustration. And the idea is that uh, I founded early on a community of uh, scientific illustrators and we uh, created a content that is live, that is on the radio, on, on, on podcast, and that can be uh, actually attended by a live audience. And every uh, scientific bit that is explained during these events is live sketch by several illustrators. And then all the images of these, uh, of these illustrators are streamed uh, simultaneously to the scientific content. And it's very dynamic, very fun, because the illustrators usually have a very different take on their scientific topic that we we gather, and um, it's a very uh, very something very uh, interesting to to organize. So, if you have the opportunity to attend one of these radio live sketch show, I would uh, strongly suggest to to uh, to to get the info from the podcast science uh, website. And for sure, if you want to organize one, I can have uh, some several tips in order to to create this kind of content. And also. I created a YouTube channel. So this is purely by peer pressure. At some point in the uh, uh, scientific community, a lot of people were actually uh, joining YouTube or created 
out of nothing uh, YouTube channel in order to uh, explain science. And this format completely exploded, um, as I'm sure you, you are uh, well aware. And um, I wanted to try how to, to do videos. Um, spoiler, it didn't go well for me. It's very difficult to, to actually create a video content. So uh, the as soon as I realized that it was difficult, I did what I do best is actually create a network of people, a community of people. So uh, I joined the Café des, Sciences, uh, Café des Sciences as a blogger community. I created an illustration a scientific communication uh, community and it was all logic for me to actually create another community that is called Video Science that is part of the Café des Sciences uh, and uh, which, which would uh, allow a community of uh, French scientific video content makers and out of these uh, different people you can see there's Viviane from Syllabus, Dirty Biology, uh, David Loap from Science Étonnante, actually David Loap was a fellow blogger who turned a uh, YouTuber at uh, some point. And you can see that there is uh, here Germain, also known as Dr. Nozman, who joined the project very early on because he was interested to actually uh, gas, um, to join a community as he is not himself a uh, scientific literate. So he wanted to actually have his content uh, evaluated and join a community for, for uh, to, 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 to belong to a, a scientific community. But he comes from a completely different background, comes from actually a video background and design background. At some point, uh, we uh, created in 2017 uh, an event in order to present the project Video Science, it was called Festival Video Science. It took place in the Cité des Sciences et de l'Industrie. And uh, at, at that time, we had very different ideas and one of them might interest you. Uh, one of them is actually a journal club. You might be in your, uh, in your you might be a postdoc, uh, a PI or a, a, a PhD uh, student and are well aware of what journal club is. And inside the video community of video science there was also a lot of academics and one idea was to actually say that we liked journal club but those journal club lacks the opportunity to actually talk to a different audience so we tried to create a journal club where we showed what a scientific paper was to a general audience and it was a very uh, challenging but interesting uh, topic and uh, uh, I advise you to actually uh, see that. And because all these ideas are coming from the same place, I actually um, thought it was a good idea to have this journal club live, but also live sketched. So there was a bunch of illustrators that were invited to live sketch the journal club while we were explaining what a scientific paper was. The, the topic of the journal club was uh, dinosaur feathers that were captured in uh, embers from Myanmar. And uh, so we talked about this uh, topic with uh, different uh, bloggers and video um, YouTubers that come from different backgrounds, but uh, mainly from the, um, uh, uh, sorry, so fr from, uh, <clears throat> paleogenomic or uh, paleo, um, uh, uh, paleontological uh, background and we talked about this feather while illustrators were actually discussing uh, uh, drawing uh, reactions to what we were uh, explaining so it, it's a very interesting way and you could try to have your journal club not dedicated to your own institute, but ideally to a broad and general audience. And it's very enlightening in the way of uh, you to be capable of explaining general science to uh, uh, layman people. I told you about uh, Dr. Nozman. So uh, at some point he, he contacted me because I contacted him first uh, in order to join my uh, video science community. And he was interested in actually acquire uh, footage from uh, uh, using microscopes. And uh, out of a complete uh, mix-up, I thought he was an expert in uh, microscopy. He thought I was an expert in uh, microscopy. And so we figured out both how to actually do that with uh, some sort of MacGyver style setup that uh, we created. And actually we did have a very uh, nice footage that we obtained during this kind of quest of uh, of uh, adapting uh, his 
type of cameras to general um, uh, microscope equipment that can find uh, in the teaching de teaching department or inside your labs. For instance, we did this kind of uh, image using crystallized uh, crystallization of uh, some substances, and also what you you might see every day if you're in a nematode lab, but uh, was very cool to share in his very uh, high tech uh, 4K camera. And while he was in the in the in the university environment, one idea uh, popped up in inside his uh, head is that he never was able to go to university. He actually uh, went to a design school, and uh, because he's a very curious uh, young man, he wanted to actually follow lectures uh, during a, a semester in order to learn more about biology. And that's how actually. Uh, uh, he created a project called uh, SciVlog, where he documented his coming back to university um, during uh, one semester. And that is why you have uh, videos where I participate and where he actually attends a lecture on, uh, on phylogenetics or uh, is uh, dissecting a cockroach. And one thing led to another uh, out of this uh, particular format, uh, a TV show, uh, a company uh, contacted us in order to actually create a particular content on TV. And because of these uh, spurious, uh, um, uh, so sorry, uh, because of, the, of, of this kind of uh, life events, uh, that is how I, uh, I participated in a TV show during uh, one season that is called Bestial, and where we go to labs to labs and uh, actually document uh, the life cycles or strange features of different organisms. Uh, while I was doing all that, I also tried to uh, challenge myself and write uh, general scientific communication using the book format. That was something that I w always wanted to do. And uh, there were three books. Um, so th there is a first book I participated from and come from the Café des Sciences community. It's a very interesting project uh, that was uh, published in uh, Berlin editions. And 40 bloggers, uh, illustrators, and YouTubers participated to this project in order to have a collection of, uh, of different chapters where we talk about everything in science that is uh, not um, entirely... Uh, so the, the idea, la, la science à contre-pied, means the science uh, on the, maybe on the wrong foot. Uh, so it's unintuitive uh, science, and we talk about unintuitive uh, scientific results. But I also did a solo projects such as my book on parasitism called Moi Parasite. Another one where I uh, gathered around my uh, my project a team of uh, archaeologists and uh, and uh, YouTubers to talk about uh, paleogenetics and paleo uh, in, in archaeology uh, in general. That is called Retour vers le Paleo. And as uh, Mathieu mentioned at the beginning of this uh, presentation, I also uh, did uh, participate to a uh, a project of a nice book uh, published in Juno, which is called Nature Secrète, where I, I actually uh, dedicated myself on giving uh, scientific uh, info on particular animals. Mathieu mentioned also teaching, and uh, that is uh, very uh, important for me. Uh, I became in 2011, uh, after a, a two years postdoc in New York, I became uh, an assistant professor. And uh, in the first year of my, uh, of my teaching uh, duties, I noticed that a lot of things that I did in, during my uh, courses were actually things that were not coming from my research, not coming from my own courses, uh, my own academic uh, teaching, but actually coming from the preparation, the research I did for blog posts. And that is something that, that is when I realized that actually a lot of the knowledge that I acquired during my career did not come uh, exactly from uh, my own research, my own uh, academic research, but actually coming from science communication. And while realizing that, I realized that it was actually a very good tool to teach. 
And that is why I created with a colleague of mine called uh, Patrick, de, Patrick Laurenti. We created a teaching uh, lecture, uh, sorry, a, a teaching module that is called Culture Biologique Numérique. So the name is irrelevant, but the idea is that we actually teach science outreach. And it's actually a module, a teaching module that has been declined in three different um, um, uh, um, so, sorry, uh, a three different level of the academy uh, uh, of the university. First and second years, but also the third year in the Magister European Genetique, and the last year uh, in, a, in a particular master that's called uh, Espace et Milieu. And in this particular teaching module, we actually uh, teach uh, students how to do blog posts, but also other uh, media. And everything that they do in their teaching modules is um, uh, have a, a social media presence on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. So the idea, the, the first thing that we tell when we have students in front of, uh, of us is that there, there is going to be evaluation of their, their work, but the most crucial evaluation is going to be from a general audience because whatever they do in the um, teaching module is going to be public. And these give them a lot of pressure. And it's actually a good idea because this pressure is crucial in order for them to be efficient and to acquire knowledge. And that's something that I actually uh, understood when I did teaching myself. When I teach, I do research on topics. I have to be the most accurate as possible because I do, do not want to disappoint my students by giving them knowledge that is uh, obsolete. I am dedicated, meaning that uh, I have to, to find the most accurate, but uh, also to, to take time in, in making sure that uh, my, my teaching is efficient for them. And I have to, to synthesize this knowledge in order to, to be uh, acquired efficiently by my, uh, by my audience, uh, here students. And all these skills, research on topics, accuracy, dedication, and synthesis are skills that are belonging to a toolbox, an essential toolbox to acquire knowledge. Uh, I feel that I'm taking too much time. And the realization is that uh, actually, it's the same thing that I uh, do when I'm blogging because the general audience is as demanding as a, a, a teaching a, a students in, in a class. And so, because I realized that it was essential tools to acquire knowledge and efficient tools to acquire knowledge, we felt with Patrick Laurenti that uh, by adapting uh, this uh, idea on creating blog posts, web comics, podcasts, videos, events, live and, and so on, uh, the students were going to acquire these uh, crucial skills that are uh, uh, crucial to actually their scientific or scientific communication careers. So here are some examples of the kind of content that uh, can be found on the culture biologique numérique. So two of them are uh, from uh, this year, uh, Forever Young uh, is a webcomic in order to understand the life cycle of uh, axolotl. There is the, uh, the life cycle of amoeba that is shown at the bottom uh, right uh, of the screen. But there are also some students that created video games or others that created actually music videos, uh, a, a version of uh, Shape of You uh, that uh, explains the Hox genes uh, phenomenon. And this year, the live event, because of the disruption of uh, coronavirus, was actually, usually we do it in an amphitheater, uh, in a live event that is uh, with a, a, a true and live audience. But this time, we actually created, uh, because of the pandemics, uh, a live event that was on Twitch. And uh, this was actually by the help of uh, the Café des Sciences, who hosted on their Twitch channel the live event that uh, took place uh, on the 26th of uh, last May. And um, the students were actually very, very uh, strong-minded and created a, a beautiful event all by themselves, which was called actually Stranger Species. Uh, Mathieu actually um, uh, 
uh, talked about uh, the way I do uh, other ways of teaching during uh, my uh, my lectures. Uh, this is one of them. I quiz my uh, students during my lectures, and here's one of the quiz uh, that actually I cross post on Twitter. The idea is here, so you have a moth, a fungi, and a sponge, and I ask my students. Uh, which are more related to each other uh, in the phylogenetic uh, point of view. Actually, we can uh, have a little break. How, has uh, someone uh, any idea as uh, who is uh, more related to each other? Uh, <laughs> I, have, I, have, I have no clue. <laughs> so someone is suggesting oh, AB? You can, you can put on the chat. Maybe. Yeah, I would say. Um, yeah. I'm not sure how to actually see that. Oh, there's a tweet. So Mathieu Schulz says A, B. Durin, Manon, and Clarisse are saying B and C. Uh, Manon says that they're both meta met as one. Daniel, B and C. Depends if you mean structure or something else. I, I, uh, I'm talking about it's a phylogenetic course, so I'm talking on the relationships in the uh, phylogenetic tree of uh, organisms. So who is more related to each other? Someone says A and C. <laughs> Very good. So you see, so you see how I, I can have a, actually a create a, some dynamics during my lecture. And the answer is uh, fungi and uh, sponge. Sponge belongs to the metazoan lineages, which means that it's an animal just like us. So uh, a lot of students were complaining because I depicted the sponge with a uh, bubble eponge. But, uh, if, I, I've, if, if I put a, a sponge uh, image, most of my students would not recognize what it was. And the thing is that fungi and metazoans belong to a particular lineage called the um, uh, uh, unicont. And whereas moth belong to another lineage, which is also in the eukaryote, but it's the sister group of unicorns. It uh, belongs to uh, the um, uh, bicont lineage, bicontal lineage. So the answer was B and C. B and C. And the idea is that I would quiz my students. They would be able to actually use a QR code. And I would compare their results with a similar uh, a quiz that I did uh, in Twitter. So the idea was to actually uh, confront them, uh, their, their response to the general Twitter, uh, Twitter sphere that uh, belongs around my, uh, my particular Twitter group. It's completely biased because uh, I, I, as I post most scientific uh, content, a lot of my um, uh, followers on Twitter are scientific uh, lit literate and most of them are actually coming from a, a, a life science background. So the, most of them knew the, the correct answer, but it's, a, it's always fun to have this kind of interaction with uh, students. All right. So I'm going to uh, finish my presentation by talking uh, briefly about social media uh, and mainly about uh, Twitter. And this will be a transition for you to actually, for, for me to actually take questions from the uh, from the audience, as I'm going to just briefly tell you that uh, science is not absent from social media, and it's actually most represented in the Twitter as a uh, this. Uh, um, <clears throat> this uh, study has been found uh, in, uh, I think it's 2018, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. And um, there's a, a particular fascinating study that has been done in 2018 that showed that your audience varies depending on your followers account. And that for, uh, by comparing 110 Twitter accounts uh, of the uh, ecology and evolution community, uh, these particular uh, author were capable of showing that the more followers you had, the more diverse they became. And there was a particular threshold around thousand of uh, followers where uh, when, when you had over a thousand followers, usually the majority is not scientific anymore, meaning that you're uh, addressing the general population. 
So it, it's a very uh, interesting way to actually uh, see that uh, what, what kind of public you're addressing when you are on social media and especially on Twitter. Meaning when you have over under uh, 100 followers, basically you're a, a scientist that just talk to other scientists. But this kind of changes the more followers you have, which is kind of uh, uh, intuitive but uh, it, it was nice to have a, 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 actually a paper addressing the question. Uh, I belong to a team, as I, Mathieu told, uh, told us, uh, where we have a Twitter team account and we're multiple admins. The, the Twitter, Twitter account is called STEM Dev Evo. And we are uh, tweeting, we, we have uh, now uh, over 720 uh, followers. So not yet thousand followers, so not yet a majority uh, of uh, general audience uh, people, but we're starting to actually uh, do science outreach project on your uh, on our Twitter account, talking about our team uh, life, but also sharing uh, general scientific content about our model organism, which is a marine worm, and our, our lab life, which sometimes interests a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, general audience people. In order to have a, a multiple admins on the same team account, uh, we use a TweetDeck or we actually share the credentials in order to log in. Uh, in um, different members can log in inside the same Twitter account. We have absolutely no way of uh, telling who has posted what content. So it's basically uh, an administration of this account that is based on trust. Um, in order to actually schedule tweets, which might be handy in some times, we use uh, one particular uh, features. Uh, we used to use Buffer, but nowadays with uh, TweetDeck and directly using the on the computer on a general uh, browser, the, the Twitter account, it is now possible to actually schedule tweets. So this kind of information is obsolete, but it's always uh, good to know that there are this kind of uh, uh, platform that exists, and especially because Buffer is allowing uh, cross-posting on different platforms such as Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, cross-posting for experts is possible also using a particular tool that is called If This Then That. And if you want to have uh, some information, I can uh, show you how, uh, how this works. And the last thing I wanted to show you is actually why would you be interested as a general researcher to use uh, Twitter uh, as a general tool to see uh, the, the extent of your research impact. And for that, you need to know about a particular tool that is called Altmetric. So I'm going to show you, sorry, up. I'm going to show you now what is Altmetric. Altmetric is something that you might have seen on some paper. It's this kind of rosette where there is a score inside. And the idea is that when you see this kind of uh, score, uh, it tells you what uh, what is the impact of uh, um, of your particular research. So I use it all the time, especially because I use it also. Um, sorry, I use it also um, in order to uh, to. It's not the thing that I wanted to. Do. Sorry, I'm going to go back to my presentation. I use it also to do a science uh, outreach project. The main idea uh, here is that he, uh, in, in this particular uh, page of uh, a paper, this paper is called Cell Lineage and Cell uh, Cycling Analysis, you see a score here and the impact that is can be found on different platforms such as Twitter. And you can see that when I tweeted this particular paper, it is gathered on the altmetric score. My, the way I use actually altmetrics is uh, is another way. I actually use altmetric, sorry, to do um, science science outreach project. Let me show you. If I go, for instance, to one of my last blog posts, you will see that at the end of my blog post, there's also sources because I talked about neurocrest and and so forth. 
And when I go to a DOI of this particular paper that is cited on my blog post, you will see here that by using the metrics button, you can see that this particular paper had an online attention with five tweets, two blogs, four uh, Facebook pages, and has been collected 260 times by Mendeley um, uh, users. And by going actually on the page, the dedicated page using uh, a bookmarklet, I'm going to show you at, uh, at, the, at the end how to use this bookmarklet. Sorry, let me try it again. Here you go. By going to the page, you can see on the blog here that there is my blog post that is collected. Meaning that now there is a real link between the paper and my science outreach project. All right, so that's basically all I wanted to tell you about uh, my work as a scientific communicator. And I'm, uh, I would be happy to, to gather your question now. Thank you very much, Pierre, for, for the presentation. Um, so we, we had at the very beginning of the, um, the talk, at the beginning of the chat, we had the, a couple of questions already. And if you want to ask more questions, you can manifest yourself in the chat. But right. so maybe we can start with uh, Annabelle Swiss, who, um, Ask a question for you, maybe Annabelle, if you want to, to ask the question directly to Pierre. Hi, uh, can you hey. see me? Yes, yep. I can see. Um, so it looks like you started with Cafe des Sciences, which kind of broadened your network, I guess. Mm -hmm. Is that how you yes. get in touch with people in the radio and how you manage to have an editorial, uh, uh, un segment editorial uh, on the radio? Mm -hmm. Like, how, how did that happen? How did the networking work? So um, it was so basically one of my advice to be a good scientific communicator is to uh, forget about be, being ridiculous and try stuff, <laughs> which is which is something that is easier said than done. But basically, what I did is um, uh, in 2012, uh, around 2012. Uh, I became vice president of the Café des Sciences, and we had a general project to actually give a, a general uh, platform for the Café des Sciences. It was one idea, it was to broaden our audience. So the, the idea of contacting uh, Radio France came from me, because I, I used to use their podcast, I'm a big fan of podcasts. And I just sent a message and say, would you be interested in having a, a presentation during your your, TV, your radio show about blog posts? Because there is nothing uh, nothing on the sort on the general radio. And uh, Mathieu Vidar, who was a host at the time, told me, well, come to the radio. We're going to discuss that. And he gave me the opportunity to, to have a one minute uh, segment. And how did you, because originally it looks like you were doing mostly written science outreach. How did you, how did you work up the courage to go on national radio and <laughs> start talking with your real voice about science, yeah. especially science that you're not an expert of originally? How did that? So I, I already participated to Podcast Science for several ah. years. So I did several work on Podcast Science uh, before that. Especially for podcast science, I tried a three-hour uh, dossier, uh, complete show on the phylo phylogeny, phylogeny uh, mm -hmm. which was very long, a uh, lot of preparation. But it's not the, the way I got my courage. It was also the first year I became assistant professor. And I told yeah. myself, uh, the first time I went to the radio show, you can be in front of students for two hours. So you can do this. You can you can be in front of a of a mic for for two hours, and actually, the um, the first year I was in the, in front of a large audience in the, in the, um, in in front of uh, students because I did not start in an amphitheater the first year, but the the first year I did uh, go in front of the amphitheater. I said, 
you weren't on national radio. So you can do this. You can be in front of students now. So basically, okay. it's, a, it's a loop. OK. But um, uh, to, to be sure, uh, it's 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 not easy. And uh, at the first time, I, I messed up. If you if you hear back my first uh, TV, I was like panicking, a lot of sweat. And oh, that's not really easy. Merci beaucoup. Yeah. Um, we also had two questions from D. Barsouk. So maybe if you want to to ask the questions directly to Pierre. <laughs> Uh, hello. Uh, sorry, yes. I don't have my <clears throat> web camera. Um, let me no just problem. find my find my questions. <laughs> um, I think the first one one you partially answered it was about podcasting. It's just that mm -hmm. I'm a, a manager for a European project which is about neural crest. And it's funny because oh. I just saw on the example that you uh, gave with Outmetric there was Igor Ademeka who is now our consortium as well. <laughs> so. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so we have uh, like 15 students who um, they, I cannot say they have to do science communication, but it's very well seen in the European Commission. Uh, sure. So we're looking for different options like blogging, podcasting is a very good idea, we didn't think about it. Um, so can you, yeah, maybe give us advice on how to approach podcasting at the very early stage because it's PhD students and they're like first second years now do you think we can already think about podcasting now or it's too early should we just start from blogging and if we start from blogging it's a following question but um, at the same time I can ask it uh, what is more important to select appropriately the hosting platform uh, which is maybe for money or it doesn't matter what hosting platform we select uh, it can be a free WordPress uh, blog but it's more important how you diffuse it and advertise um, it. Yeah, okay. It's a very, very good question and very precise questions, uh, we, which we actually uh, um, uh, go around uh, routinely when we're starting projects in the Café des Sciences or uh, with uh, the, the teaching uh, with uh, Culture Biologique Numérique or with Podcast Science. So, my advice would uh, because in Culture Biologique Numérique, we don't have a medium that is uh, actually um, <coughs> fixed. We we'll tell the students, if you want to do podcasting, do podcasting. If you want to do blog posts, we'll, we'll do blog posts. If you want to do videos, you'll do videos. The only thing that we want is them to have at least one blog post. And that is very important because we want, we want to have a written um, uh, abstract of what, we, what they did. And that would be basically my uh, first point, is that whatever you do, at the end, do have a blog post, do do have a uh, written content. Even if it's not uh, posted on a particular uh, platform uh, di directly, it would be useful. For instance, if you do a video and you prepare a text first, then it can be the basis of your uh, subtitles, which is very important to have a broader audience and uh, to, to have a to 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 have the most uh, uh, broad audience and uh, especially the the, the ones that are not uh, capable to hear. Uh, but also, um, you you talked about what kind of platform do you have? And most of the platform we choose are free. For blog posts, we use WordPress because it has a free account. For podcast hosting, we use SoundCloud because it has the possibility to be free. So it's very important to 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 have a free option in order to create this kind of content um, but at some point uh, there is a, something that's going to come up is the quality of what you're doing for the writing you need to have peer reviewers in order to make sure that the scientific content is relevant but then for other projects such as video and uh, audio you also need a quality check which is relevant for uh, for writing because you need your style to be nice to to, to read and uh, you need your illustration to be good you need to be your illustrations to be uh, fair of a fair use uh, using uh, uh, images that come from a uh, um, uh, free to use and uh, uh, public domain contents but then when you're doing using audio or video the quality is very relevant and from my experience, 
the most thing, the most important thing you must acquire is a good mic. Even if you do a video, uh, you could have a crappy image, but the, the thing that needs to be correct is the audio input because it's the most important thing in the in both video and podcasting. So if you would start to have a budget, the thing that I would uh, choose as the first line of budget is not the platform where you post your content, but it's the mic. Okay, and, thank you. Uh, no problem. <laughs> Um, another question from Manon, uh, if you are still here, Manon, can, I don't see her, ah, okay, uh, so she cannot talk yet, so I'm just going to ask the question for herself, so right. uh, she wanted to know how do you manage your time between research and all your science communication activities, and also how well was it um, this activity of science communication accepted by your supervisors along your career? That is a very good question and very important to, to answer. Uh, science communication for me is a hobby. I don't do sports. I don't have children. I do scientific communication. That is, that is my hobby. So that's, that is why I have so many projects. It doesn't mean that you, you, you need to have that amount of free time in order to, to do scientific communication, but it's, it's very, uh, what we call in French, chronophage. It's very, very time consuming. Um, so it takes a lot of time and you have to make sure that you can actually benefit from this time spent uh, in this way. For me, it's because it's a hobby, it makes me happy. So that's the very first benefit. But also, as I hope to have shown you during all my presentation, it has an impact in my career, especially in the academic teaching and research uh, community. It has a good impact. At the beginning, when I did my manuscript, uh, my thesis, and I started my blog, I used an avatar. I, uh, it was Topo. I used a particular image in order to mask my, uh, my, uh, my identity because I was sure that if my supervisor found out, it was the end of my uh, blogging career and they would say, oh, you need to focus on your thesis, uh, you cannot do that. So I was kind of paranoid and thought that it was not a good idea to have my supervisor know about this, uh, this particular activity. As soon as I became on the other side as a teaching assistant, I asked my students to actually do blog posts because I feel, I feel that for my experience, it was the most important thing to, to learn uh, scientific communication in order to to address uh, the general public with your own research. So I would say, depending on the supervisor, you might have very different uh, outlooks. But nowadays, as um, I, I'm not sure I, I follow the name, but uh, Barsuk uh, uh, told, there is a lot of impetus and uh, motion from the uh, general funding agencies in order to highlight your scientific communication skill. So I would not be surprised that most supervisors now are very happy for you to start a scientific communication uh, activity. Um, another question from Annabelle about your bionumeric class. Uh, yeah, Annabelle, like interested. Person, yeah, I can, I can do that. Yeah, so uh, sorry, I was in magister too, um, just after you, I think. We didn't have any class on on science, science outreach, <laughs> unfortunately. Yes. Uh, is your class open to other people who are not in high in university anymore? <laughs> it's can a very good uh, question. Okay. We actually started this year, uh, um, um, formation continue. Uh, cool. uh, teaching course uh, using exactly the, the scaffold of Bionum. So it's going to be uh, accessible for a general public. Unfortunately, it was the first year. It was in March, April, <laughs> so it got cancelled. <laughs> but the next year, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to be able to actually uh, have this uh, class open to everyone. So uh, it's, it's a cross-platform, cross-institutes, uh, so it's, I'm going to advertise it and uh, maybe I'll, I'll ask Matthew, Matthew to, <laughs> to to be able to to post it on the Institut Curie. Uh, yeah, because if we can have it, it would be really great. I, there is 
a lot that I didn't know about the online platforms. Yeah, yeah. And, and basically, the, the one thing that I, uh, I learned from uh, this kind of uh, lecture is that most of the things that I learned came from the students themselves. Because oh, okay. it's, it's a problem solving uh, situation. Whenever you have a blog post, you have an idea, and then <laughs> you have to find your, the solution. And the solution, especially online, are going so fast that uh, most of the things that I taught three years ago are completely obsolete now. Okay. Yeah. Um, someone has a last question. Okay. So I have I have one very general question uh, for you. I just wanted to have your opinion about. So because of course during the pandemic we we got literally bombed with scientific information which was not used to be like this in in, me, in the media. And so I wanted to know your insight about what should be like the bare minimum that a PhD student or scientist should do about general communication about sciences. Because from your experiences, I can see that you, you build a lot of network and a lot of collaborations in order to build your scientific communication. But if you are a more isolated scientist, how, do you, how would you advise to handle scientific communication? My uh, answer might surprise you, but I would tell you that because, especially during the pandemic, uh, scientific media was, uh, so, so, sorry, uh, social media was so important and maybe overwhelming, I would, I would advise you to get the science, uh, social media presence that you feel comfortable with. And if it's none, then it's none. <laughs> If you if you don't feel um, at home in social media, if you have never done it, maybe a pandemic would not be the best idea to to start with. Well, we saw a lot of uh, um, uh, scientific uh, people embracing social media without realizing the backlash that they could get at that, at that uh, particular period. So uh, social media is a double-edged sword, and you might get uh, cut when you want to help. So my idea would be to try small at first, try at your at your level, and especially try at something that you feel important and and good for you. If, for instance, I never would dream to talk about coronavirus if I if I hadn't the the knowledge to to, to go talk about it. If you go to my Twitter account, there was maybe three or four tweets that uh, was relevant to coronavirus, most of the, what I tweet about are strange creatures, my research, and uh, picture of cats. That, because that's what I feel comfortable with uh, sharing uh, at the moment. And if, if you're not capable or feel not capable to share stuff uh, on social media, then don't. It's, it's nothing to worry about. You, you can do scientific communication another way. Sometimes it's man to man sometimes it's uh, going in front of a class and sometimes no scientific communication because you're not skilled or uh, com comfortable enough to to do that and it's nothing to worry about okay so thank you very much pierre mm -hmm. for your time and your great presentation and answers and thank you everyone to attend this uh, session so as I said at the beginning, this session has been recorded. So if you know someone who would wanted to attend the meeting but couldn't do it on time, it would be soon available on the Curie webpage of the Association of the Young Researchers. So stay tuned, guys. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Pierre. Thank you. Have a good day. Can you stop the recording now? Sorry. I forgot.